Hello and welcome to The Burning Question. My name is Peter and I have Jason Aramburu, who's the uh, CEO and CEO and co-founder of Climate Robotics here. Thanks for uh, chatting with us today, Jason. Great to be here. Um, well, so uh, you just graduated from an accelerator, uh, Urban X, I think. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, Climate Robotics and, and uh, kind of the process leading up to this um, kind of departure point of the, from the accelerator. So we're developing biochar technology for in-field conversion of agricultural waste into biochar. And, um, you know, my co-founder and I have been in the biochar space a long time. And one of the challenges that we've seen with really taking biochar to scale um, is that it's hard to really access uh, agricultural waste as a feedstock because it's distributed, um, it's low value um, and uh, you know, the, the pyrolysis systems, gasification based systems uh, often want you know, really consistent feedstock. And so um, what we've developed is actually a, a continuous pyrolysis system that can be driven or uh, driven autonomously uh, down a field and actually converts the agricultural residues into char uh, on site in the field. Super cool. So you've told me about this before and I've done a little reading, but to clarify language, you know, when people talk about agricultural residue, there's a bunch of different categories. People I think can think of like um, shells, which are typically have been kind of part of the biochar world for a while. Um, and then there's like rice husk, like what uh, husk and uh, a few other people are doing. What you're actually talking about is like what's left in the field. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Things like corn stubble, stover, um, you know, everything that's left in the field after harvest, all the dry material. That's awesome. And, and so, you know, you said you've been in around, in around biochar for a long time. Like I actually like found a YouTube video of you from, I think 2013. Yeah. <laughs> you've been around this, like, um, how, you know, is, is this the, is the beginning of this kind of a, an opportunity to, um, to, to take advantage of, of, you know, obviously what you've learned, but also it sounds like novel technology. Yeah, um, it's, it's a combination of kind of what we've learned, uh, my co-founder and I in the biochar industry, like where the opportunities are, where the unmet needs are. And then, yeah, also, you know, in 15 years, the technology has really changed dramatically and it's, it's um, easier and cheaper than ever to build, you know, uh, microcontrollers and autonomous vehicles and autonomous robots. Um, and so, you know, that just wasn't possible even like five years ago. Yeah. So, okay. So, so tell me what we're dealing with. Are we talking like Autobot? Are we talking? <laughs> Does it walk? <laughs> it doesn't walk. So um, the system, you know, it rolls and it's uh, GPS controlled today also teleoperated. So you can program the robot with the path you want it to take on the farm and it will drive down the field and, and pyrolyze sort of all biomass in its, in its way. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, you know, we're working on improving the autonomy so that it's, it's gonna be less hands-on. Um, you know, the goal is to get to the point where uh, a single human operator can just manage a fleet of these uh, across a whole farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, to give an idea of how like um, afraid I'd be, uh, afraid I'd be <laughs> something that turns everything into char, um, how big are they? So the, the current generation uh, prototype that we're testing, it's about, you know, the robot is about 30 inches wide. So about the size of a, a typical row on a farm. Um, and then it's, you know, probably about five feet long. So, so not, not huge systems. Got it. Um, and, and what kind of, it sounds like you guys have already done some multiple iterations and obviously what I'm about to ask changes in, re in relation to those things, but say on your newest prototype, how much land do they, do you expect them to cover? And you know, so, um, in our tests, you know, we've been able to operate the robot at a speed of about one acre per hour. Um, and I think as we improve the technology, we could, we could make that a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And so the, is the goal to deal is to, I mean, obviously, you know, this is what you're doing is super interesting and in many ways novel because you're actually making 
um, biochar kind of you're making biochar in the field, which traditionally, at least in my experience, I haven't seen many people applying biochar at super high levels in their in fields. Like this sure. something that people it's not it hasn't gotten there in the market yet. Like how much does your product cost to use? And then who are you targeting? Who are the people that are like, oh, I want that? So um, today, you know, we're operating it as a service business right now mm -hmm. because uh, it's not to the point where we could just give someone a machine and they could use it. Um, yeah. so, we, so we own and operate it. And today we're charging about $50 an acre. Um, you know, that price may change as, as we grow and scale and, uh, you know, start to work with more customers. And today, most of the customers are farmers. Um, we have a whole pipeline of interested customers. Um, some have heard of biochar, some haven't. Um, but it's really, you know, farmers that that care about their soil health and improving the quality of their soil. And is that the primary driver for them is soil health? Is it like, because there are other aspects of this that in the biochar community, it's like water retention, nutrient retention, you know, all these different things. Yeah, I uh, think mostly their main, their main concern is reducing input cost. So, you know, whether that's water, nutrients, um, or, you know, things like lime, for instance, if they're uh, in, if they have low pH soil. Yeah, so do you guys produce ash? Um, you know, we can really control the pyrolysis conditions in the system. So, like, if there's a need to produce a higher ash biochar, we can do that. Oh, cool. So people could say, you know, this, I was going to have to spend money online, but instead you guys Exactly. Can. Exactly. That's neat. Um, and uh, it sounds like you've got some pilots going now. Where are, where are those? And, and where do you kind of, what's the extent of the, the growth that you expect in the, the, this fall, say? Primarily in Texas right now, because, um, you know, that's where we are. And just timing wise, there's a lot of dry biomass in South Texas right now. Um, so, you know, we'll probably concentrate on this market for a little while, but um, we see, you know, potential applications and we have kind of a pipeline of customers uh, all across North America. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a carbon aspect of this, as you know, the there's the soil portion of biochar, which is obviously important. Um, I think I'm most interested in the carbon capture side. How does that fit into the way that you're thinking about your business? Do you? Um, yeah, well, we want to get the business to the point where, you know, the business, at least on a per unit basis, where we're profitable on the service fees alone, because, you know, we think uh, we have identified a subset of the market where biochar really solves a problem for them. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to focus on that first, but but yeah, once we get to a large enough scale, we are absolutely interested in you know uh, accounting for the carbon that we're sequestering and potentially monetizing it as well, because I think that opens up a lot of new potential business opportunities when you can also monetize the carbon. Yeah, and I think I think I am similarly uncomfortable with the idea of an entire business premise being that you can get paid for this stuff and hoping that the price doesn't change and so on. Right. Um, but if you were to get paid, you could, you know, allow, it would allow you a lot of price flexibility in the short term and incentivizing people to kind of do this. Um, is What else is the machine able to do? I imagine that, you know, you're driving through the field, you're, you're, you have to kind of chop down the biomass, blend it up in some sense, pyrolyze it. And then do you cool it? It, do you, uh, what else, what else happens? Yeah. The system has active and passive cooling, uh, cooling systems to, to bring it down to a safe temperature. Um, and then we can also, you know, quench it and inject in, um, any kind of, you know, liquefied fertilizer or anything that'll, that'll dissolve in water. We can add to the biochar as well before putting it on the soil. It's interesting. Is there, are you replacing an entire sweep through the fields for, for, for farmers? Potentially. Yeah. I mean, it, it depends on the farmer, what, you know, what they typically apply in terms of inputs and also when they apply it. But, um, you know, definitely we're, we're streamlining the process of converting those residues into biochar. Yeah. Um, obviously you're just putting it on the fields now. Um, when you're talking to farmers, what are you, what, you know, what, how, how do you sell it? I mean, it's, it's a relatively low cost product, but it's not 
um, insubstantial. I assume some of these people have tens of thousands of acres. Obviously, yeah. It doesn't seem like you're doing it quite at that scale yet, but like, what's the value prop that you're giving to them? Well, what really resonates with them is, is number one, just reducing input cost because, because farmers are really cost driven. Like a lot of farmers, if you said to them, I'll increase your yield 20%, they might say, well, okay, I don't believe you. Or they might even say, I don't even really know what my yield is on a per acre basis today. So, you know, I'm not interested in that. But if you can reliably say to a farmer, I'll reduce your input cost by X, they'll listen to you. You know, they're interested in that because, because farming is really, really uh, cost driven. Yeah. And do you have any idea what your, what, or what do you think at this point your reduction in input costs would be? It's too early to say, but um, you know, we do know that for, for instance, for ag lime, um, you know, an application of ag lime on a, a Midwest row crop, I mean, that might save you one or $200 per acre uh, in terms of inputs. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, I didn't know that that's what things cost. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, so how, you know, where, what stage are you guys at now? Where are you planning on being, um, you know, it sounds like you're kind of uh, quickly iterating through um, physical prototypes, but what's the development of the company like? Well, um, you know, we're working on the next prototype, which would be our third generation system and uh, improving the autonomy, but also trying to build case studies with our existing customers, um, because we think that's really important too. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, gathering the data across multiple seasons. So, uh, and, you know, that's going to be ultimately a multi-year process to, to collect that data. But uh, we think that's going to be really important and is going to be something that kind of sets us apart in the space also, having that data. Mm -hmm. Oh, speaking of which, I meant to ask you, does, can you measure the biochar that you produce? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can measure in real time how much biochar we're producing at any location on any spot. That's, that's, so, that's super cool. Um, so is the ultimate vision and maybe, you know, maybe you're not there yet, but um, what's the, like, do you want farmers to own one or do you want to have big tractor trailer trucks that have 10 of them piled up and you go to a field and. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would be great if we could sell them to farmers one day. I don't know if that will ultimately, you know, I don't know if the autonomy will get there. So for yeah. now, we're kind of, you know, we're owning and operating the service. And I think as we grow, you know, if we're successful, we'll, we'll uh, look at like the co-op model, you know, potentially leasing these to co-ops who could then deliver the service. Because that's how a lot of inputs are sold and delivered already. Um, oh. So I think it kind of fits within that model too. Right. Um, cool. Well, so um, it's so exciting to hear about this. I think, like, I remember um, in early days of me like getting into this I was dreaming of a little mobile pyrolysis machine yeah. like uh, <laughs> follow me around in the woods and I would like feed it sticks yep yep I would try and follow me around and I had like a little dream I was like, I'm, I'm, like I've got the most amazing idea and um <laughs> and and this is like really pretty close <laughs> yeah. so it's, like, pretty, it's, a, it's really fun and a very eerie feeling to be like Oh, this is great. This is, you know, <laughs> I really hope this is, uh, I hope I get to, to see one of these. Um, well, so is there anything else you want to share before we wrap? I'll, I'll send along any, um, uh, pass along any pictures and stuff that you have uh, mm -hmm. so that people can take a look at, at what you, uh, you're producing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, we're really excited about it. And, you know, we're interested to talk to anybody in the, the biochar community or the farming community that's interested. I mean, you know, one of the interesting things now um, is that because uh, we, we get asked a lot like is there a downside to using these agricultural residues you know for something other than uh, just kind of uh, cover or for like tilling and it's kind of interesting because we're in the middle of sort of a revolution there like the, the USDA is is now starting to recommend that most farmers should not till their residues under because it's just not a profitable use of that material. And, uh, you know, there's now a lot of emerging research that's showing biochar is a much more effective and more efficient use of that carbon. So, um, 
so it's really exciting time to, to, to be in that space. Yeah. That's super exciting. What's the, do you, do you have off the top of your head? Uh, this is a lot to ask, but like, there's a lot of farmland in America. Presumably there's a lot of corn stover, et cetera, left over. What is that in biochar? Do you have any idea? Well, like yeah, um, I don't have the exact number, but you know, we have about 800 million acres of uh, farmland in the U.S., productive farmland, and roughly 80% of that is used for row crops. So the major, you know, the four major crops, corn, beans, wheat, and cotton. Yeah. Um, and so of that, you know, 80% subset, the, the availability of residues will range from like one to one and a half tons on the very low end, all the way up to, you know, over three and a half tons on the high end. So, I mean, you know, it's a sizable amount of biomass, yeah. suffice to say. <laughs> if, you were to, if you were to turn it by swoop of magic uh, robots uh, into biochar, we're talking 200 million or whatever tons of biochar. Oh yeah, yeah, well, definitely yeah. hundreds of millions of tons of biochar if yeah. you were to convert all of that. Right. So it's- there we and, are. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, that doesn't even take into account like degraded land. There's over 2 billion acres of degraded land in the world that, you know, was once productive and now is not. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of biomass out there. There's a lot of biomass. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for, for chatting with us. Um, how do we follow along with your, your story? Um, you know, you could, you can check out climaterobotics.com and sign up for the newsletter. Um, the website's a little sparse right now, but, uh, you know, that's the easiest or just, uh, you know, re reach out to me directly as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking time, Jason. It's always fun. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.